Good morning and welcome to Redford Aldersgate. I'm Reverend Ben Bauer. It is a joy to be here with you on this first Sunday of the new year. Uh, friends, if you're a guest that's visiting with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're a church that seeks to make Christ's love visible through inc inclusivity, hospitality, and service. We're a church where we are black and white, where we're LGBTQ and straight, we're rich and poor and differently abled. We come as we are to worship because God has welcomed us and invited us to be worshiping together today. So let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship this amazing God. Amen. Friends, will you rise in body or in spirit and join in our call to worship this morning? For all the saints who went before us, spoke to our hearts, and touched our lives with God's holy fire, we give thanks, O oh God. For all the saints who live beside us, whose courage, compassion, and service strengthen our own, we give thanks, O oh God. For all the saints who are to come, who will take on challenges and seek peace for the good of the world, we give thanks, O oh God. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us worship God with joy. Amen, amen. Friends, I invite you to remain standing in body or in spirit and join in our opening song of praise for all the saints, it's number 2283 in the little black book. <laughs> Seated. 
few announcements for us this morning in the life of the church. Uh, the first of which is that we have a, a new member meeting that's coming up uh, on January 16th. It's a couple Sundays from now, January 16th, we're going to meet in the parlor. This is an information meeting for those who are not yet members but are interested in what it would look like to become a member of Redford Aldersgate. Uh, if you would like to uh, come and check that out, um, it's no pressure. Uh, by going to the meeting, you're not, you know, signing your name on anything. You're not declaring anything, but it's, it's just information uh, that will help you sort of decide if you want to take that next step. And again, that's January 16th. Two o'clock here at the church. It'll be in the parlor, which is just around the corner here in the building. Uh, also, uh, we have our uh, youth group that's going to be starting up again uh, next Sunday, January 9th. Youth group is at 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, it's for kids who are in grades 6 through 12. Um, so if you've got a young person in your life who is not yet in youth group but would like to be in youth group, um, this is a great time for them to jump in as we're getting things started for the second half of their school year. Um, also, uh, if you are a parent of a child in youth group, uh, they will be, uh, there will be a parent information meeting that will be at 5.30 right before youth group starts. If you are joining us uh, online on Facebook or YouTube today, uh, I want to extend a special welcome to you and encourage you to connect with each other while you're online uh, and also to follow us on Facebook or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay up to date as things change around the life of the church. Friends, those are all of uh, the information things, all the welcome and announcement things I have for us today. And at this time, I would like us to center ourselves in an attitude of prayer. One of the special things that we do here at Redford Aldersgate at the beginning of each year is to remember and to celebrate the, life, the lives of the saints in our midst. Now, we weren't really able to do this in our, our traditional way uh, last year because of the pandemic, and so this year we are incorporating the names of those who have died over the last two years, so 2020 and 2021. We remember them for all the gifts that they have brought to us, for the light and love that they brought to this congregation and to the people of this community. The names that we will be reading aloud here today are names of members of this church and also family members and beloved friends. If you hear the name of someone who you know and you love and you remember, I encourage you, as their name is read, to stand. We will read their name. We'll read a short uh, description of them. Some of those have been submitted by family members. Uh, and then we will take time to light a candle in their memory and we'll ring a bell in honor of them. Hear the names of these saints. Betty Bacon. Betty is a beloved member of this church. Her warmth, her honesty, her silliness is a part of what makes us who we are. We give thanks to God for her memories that fill this place, and we celebrate her life in Christ. Theo Beadle. Her family writes, We remember Theo as a fun, loving mom and grandma who loved her family and her church family. She always prayed daily for her family, and she loved to cook, garden, go on vacations, and travel. We celebrate her life in Christ. Janie Ellison Browning. 
the beloved mother of Kimberlyn Davis. If love is like a flower, then you are our family's seed. We celebrate her life in Christ. Grace stop, Stock Capstick. Paul Kinney wrote, she was my grandfather's second wife. Grandma Grace was just a few years older than my mother, but she was the grandmother I knew. After Grandpa had a heart attack and recovered, Grace, in her 50s, decided to get her bachelor degree in nursing and then worked as a nurse. She was always kind, a wonderful hostess, and a great cook. She will be missed. We celebrate her life in Christ. Beverly Castleberry. Bev is a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate. Her faithful example of generosity and grace helped to guide a path for future generations of her family, her church, and her community. We celebrate Bev's life in Christ. John Cruz. We remember John as always being there, as a best friend, fun-loving, supportive, caring father who wanted to provide for his family. He loved going on vacations, celebrating birthdays, decorating for Christmas, and being with the family. We celebrate John's life in Christ. Edith Lorraine Hartwig. Edith was born on April 20th, 1926, and died May 11th, 2020. She was a loving mother to Tom, Charles, Ruth, and Earl. She was married to Warren for 49 years, from 1951 until his passing in 2000. Edith was a member of Trinity United Methodist Church in Roseville, Michigan, for 63 years from 1957 to 2020. We give thanks and celebrate her life in Christ. Elaine Kinney, sister of Paul Kinney, the fifth of six siblings. She worked as a librarian in Saginaw. She was devoted to her wife, Sarah. They were together for 25 years. When they announced that they were getting married in 2015, a niece said, wait, they're not? Elaine liked to try new foods and enjoyed gardening. Elaine and Sarah always had three or four dogs and a couple of cats. She left us too soon. We celebrate her life in Christ.
Sarah Rattray. Sister-in-law of Paul Kinney and Elaine Kinney's wife. They met at the library where Sarah also worked. And to protect their jobs, they said little of their relationship. And when Elaine was hospitalized and Sarah needed time off, no need only to hide after that. Sarah lived only 17 months after Elaine, dying of a broken heart. We celebrate her life in Christ. James McCann. James is a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate, whose kindness, hospitality, and spirit helped to make us what we are. We're grateful for his life, love, and connection here in this place, in our community, and in our world. Today we celebrate his life and Christ. Marion Pittman. Marion is the beloved husband of Renee Pittman and a member of our Brightmore campus. He was a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, whose example in the faith has helped to shape generations of Christians. Marion was supportive, encouraging, and kept diligent watch over his church home. We celebrate his life in Christ. Ruth Regan. Ruth is a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate. We give thanks to God for her memories that fill this place, for her life and her love is known here. We celebrate her life in Christ. Jean Smith. Jean was also a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate. Her family writes that we remember Jean as a gentle, kind lady that was devoted to her family. She was joyful, quick to laugh, and had a calm demeanor. Jean always dressed nice, yet was very huggable. She lived to be 100 years old and was grateful for each day and she thanked the Lord for each night. We celebrate her life in Christ. Kathy Spear. Kathy is a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate, the wife of Bill, mother of Mary Jean. Kathy was a constant welcoming presence in the church who had a big heart for the ministries of support that we provide. Her light here helped to make a difference in the lives of others in our community. And so we celebrate her life in Christ.
Ruth Turner. Ruth is a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate. Today we are grateful for her life, her love, and connection to our community. We give thanks to God for her faithfulness and the love that she shared here. We celebrate Ruth's life in Christ. Rick Higgins. Rick is the beloved husband of Barb and longtime member of Redford Aldersgate. Rick loved to tell the story of Jesus' love for all of God's children. He was a steadfast disciple. He loved his family, spoiled his grandchildren, and had a deep appreciation for cars and motorcycles. Rick was also a talented artist, and many of his works can be found around the church. We celebrate his life in Christ. Shirley Gleason. Shirley is a beloved longtime member of Redford Aldersgate. Her gentleness and prayerfulness helped to encourage and inspire others in the faith. She loved to travel, spend time with her grandchildren, and be in ministry. We celebrate Shirley's life in Christ. George Miller. George is the beloved husband of Julie and a loving member of Redford Aldersgate. We give thanks to God for his memories that fill this place and remind us of God's great and enduring love for us. We celebrate George's life in Christ. Ernest Lee. Ernest was a beloved member of Redford Aldersgate. We're grateful for his kindness, his compassion, his life and love. We thank God for his faithfulness and remember him fondly. We celebrate his life in Christ. Let us pray. O holy and living God, we give thanks to you for these saints, for the names of those who have gone before us. We thank you for their memory, for that of them that has made us what we are. We thank you that you continue to call out to us, Lord, that you speak our names and you call us beloved. Remind us, O oh God, as we begin this new year, this new season, a new time to look ahead and to wonder and to pause and to think on where we'll go next. 
remind us of those who've gone before. Help us to celebrate the life that you have given to us, even as we recall in memory those who have died over the last two years. May your spirit be upon us to encourage us, strengthen us, embolden us in your gospel. Let us feel your love here in this place. And let us know and have confidence, O God, that these saints are wrapped in the arms of your mercy and grace. Give us hope for your resurrection, Lord, that you call us to new life, life that is eternal and everlasting. Help us to know that no matter where we find ourselves on this life's journey, no matter the condition of our bodies, no matter the trials that we face, that you love us. You have always loved us. And you continue to call us by your grace to be in community with one another, to be in communion with you, and to taste the goodness that you offer to us. Lord, be with us. Hear our prayers this morning, the longings of our hearts. Be with this world as we come into a new year. Allow us, Lord, to, to live in your light and your example. Perfect us in your love and allow us to move ever closer to your kingdom. Help us to see heaven here among us. Help us to know that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that extends through time and space. Strengthen us for a new day. And may your peace prevail here in this world. And may your church be bold in its mission that we might make disciples of Jesus Christ and that the world would know your name and know your love because of what we do. We thank you, God, for this time that we share together. We thank you for the life that you've given to us and the love that continues and never ends. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to build us up as your body, to be your hands and feet. Hear our prayers this morning. And especially in this moment, Lord, hear the words, hear the words that we speak together, that we pray together now as we join our voices in one. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we come now to a time of offering our response to the goodness of God in our lives. Or we share in the gifts and graces that God has given to us, and we uphold each other in this church and the mission that we seek to do here. Friends, I implore you to invite the Holy Spirit to be among you, to take a pause and a breath, to remember the grace that God has given to you, and to celebrate God in whatever way you can as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
gracious God, receive these gifts that come out of the grace that we have received, the love that you have given to us. Use these gifts, Lord, for the work of your church, for the building of your kingdom, and for the love of all the world. We ask these things and celebrate them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a wonderful documentary that came out a few years ago uh, on Fred Rogers, right? Uh, Mr. Rogers. It's called Won't You Be My Neighbor? Uh, Now, I grew up watching uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is uh, kind of remarkable considering that uh, I think my parents also grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I'm sure some of you did as well, right? The show was on from something like 1968 to 2001, so just a very long-running show. Um, But it was, I don't know if you've seen this documentary or not, but it is remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable to to look at the history of this guy. He's a Presbyterian minister who uh, wanted to communicate to children, wanted to communicate to young people uh, on their level and speak to them in a way that, uh, that they could understand and, and really and not talk down to them, right? Not talk down to children, uh, not, not make them feel like they were less than, but you know, include them in the bigger conversations that were going on in the room. And his show were tackled some uh, pretty, pretty big topics, right, uh, at their time, um, they had this uh, one moment that was uh, really remarkable for a, a number of reasons, but uh, they had the, the police officer who came on the show was a black man, and at the time, right, in which that episode aired, uh, that was an unusual thing to begin with, and there was a lot of racial tension, um, and he, they, they washed each other's feet. They, they had a little kiddie pool thing there together, and this moment of human contact between these two guys was... Game-changing. Game-changing. Not only for adults, but like for the children who were growing up in a world where that sort of thing did not happen, right? Fred Rogers was willing and, and uh, encouraged us to open up ourselves as a, as a culture and as a community to be more understanding, to be more under- accepting, to be more loving of one another, to look behind and look past the the prejudices and and the hatred and the histories that we had shared together and begin to build something new. And there were so many moments like that uh, in that documentary and in that show uh, where he he would bring in uh, real things that were happening in the world and things that other adults wouldn't really talk about and certainly wouldn't explain to their children or wouldn't try and push their children forward, but Fred Rogers would. And I think about him uh, today uh, because that sort of work helps to bring light into the world, right? That sort of work is gospel work. It helps to to transform our world and helps to bring people closer to the kingdom of God by, by welcoming in new generations, by speaking to people where they're at, by tackling the important things that are happening among us in ways that are, are real and are compassionate and are full of generosity and grace, Hear this word this morning that comes to us from the epistle to the Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Didn't realize I lost my slide person there. Let me get my remote real quick. Hear this word. Bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in God's presence before the creation of the world. God destined us to be his adopted children through Jesus Christ because of his love. This was according to his good will and plan and to honor his, gracious grace, or his glorious grace that he has given to us freely through the Son whom he loves. 
We have been ransomed through his son's blood, and we have forgiveness for our failures based on his overflowing grace, which he poured over us with wisdom and understanding. God revealed his hidden design to us, which is according to his good will and the plan that he intended to accomplish through his son. This is what God planned for the climax of all times, to bring all things together in Christ, the things of heaven along with the things of earth. We have also received an inheritance in Christ. We were destined by the plan of God who accomplishes everything according to his design. We are called to be an honor to God's glory because we were the first hope in Christ. You too heard the word of truth in Christ, which is the good news of your salvation. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit because you believed in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on your inheritance, which is applied toward our redemption as God's own people, resulting in the honor of God's glory. This is the word of God for the people of God, for which we say, thanks be to God. Amen. This letter was written by the Apostle Paul, and he fills this uh, page with more words than I think our, our ears can hear, and it really kind of reads uh, in the Greek as like a, run, a, excuse me, a one long run-on sentence, right? Paul is so captivated uh, with adoration and praise that he seems to forget to even take a pause or a breath as he, as he explains all of this to the church. And his letter to the early church in Ephesus is an example, just like the perfect example of his theology. Everything begins with the gospel, which then informs the church's story and how we are to live in the world. Paul doesn't begin with, with household codes. He doesn't begin with rules. He doesn't begin with a litany of things that people need to do. But he begins with this beautiful poem of salvation that informs who we are, who God is, and where God is taking us. And it's difficult to, to separate the praises and adoration of God from the blessings that Paul bestows upon the church. This, this, passage, this passage speaks of God's blessings for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. It's meant to be a lavish outpouring of affection. And yet, it is also difficult to read. It's disturbed a lot of followers of Christ for a long time. Paul said that God chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. Some folks would call that predestination, right? That like things are completely out of your control, that like God has sort of set up, here's the list of people uh, that are all good, right? And here's the list of people that are not going to make the cut. Right, and that's it. That's predestination, right? And so people really struggle with that. Um, it's caused schism in the church, meaning the church is split. It's caused a lot of uh, heartache and headache for, for theologians and, and church leaders and pastors and parishioners, right? All the people have struggled with this idea, uh, in part because it kind of conflicts with our understanding of human uh, free will, right? It seems uh, if, if that's really the case, like God is making a list of who's naughty and nice and like that's just where you're separated and that's how it's going to be, that it, we kind of lose a relationship there, that God becomes more tyrannical than grace-filled. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement, was so disturbed by the idea that he, he said it overturns God's justice, mercy, and truth. Yea, it represents the most holy God as worse than the devil. This beautiful poem Paul has written is really tough to read sometimes. And I think that Paul would have been a little um, saddened to, to hear how much we struggle with these words. See, I think the poem of praise that Paul was so excited about that he couldn't even take a breath as he's writing it, that it was one long run-on sentence. It isn't a diatribe on who's in or out in the kingdom of God. It's not about making a list and separating people out. It's it's wonderment at the incomprehensible vastness of God's love in the past, present, future. Paul exalts the work of God, the triune God, right? The Father's eternal plan, the Son's implementation, the Spirit's guarantee that the plan will reach completion. God does this through blessing. This blessing flows from God who is worthy of all of our praise. And so Paul uses this adoration and worship of God as the starting point to encourage 
the church, to encourage the church in the blessings of God. Paul is, is writing this as a way of, of speaking to people about what it means to be chosen. It's, it's language that should be very really comfortable for Paul, right? It's, a, it's a, a place that he's been, and he's sat with this idea of being chosen, of being the people who would be uh, elected by God for a long time. But the church is becoming something new as Paul is writing this, right? New people are coming into the church, right? He writes about being grafted onto the family tree, about being adopted, Right? The idea here is that God is opening things up for all people. That This isn't just about one family. It's not just about a particular people, but it's about all people. That what God is really at work at in the world is trying to include, not leave people out. That can be really hard to, to get, though. It can be really hard to get. Because, one, if you're somebody who is, like, sold on the idea that you are the special person, right, that you are uh, part of the chosen few that get to be in the love and grace of God, then it can be really difficult to, like, let that go and let other people in, which the church is dealing with when Paul is writing this. It can also be really hard to accept an invitation, these blessings must have been really hard for the, uh, the Gentile believers who are joining the church, who are starting to come in, who are um, beginning to hear the gospel and beginning to understand a little bit of what Jesus uh, is saying to them. And they, I can imagine that they had to have every kind of excuse under the sun for why they were not really the ones. Why they weren't really you know, chosen, why they weren't really loved of God God may have chosen some people from before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, but surely it could not be them. So I think Paul knows what they're, what they're thinking, and so he goes out of his way in this opening to the letter to the Ephesians to pile on blessings, right? Adoption, redemption, the forgiveness of sins. These folks aren't late-inning substitutions, right? They're not relief pitching here, right? They have been a magnificent part of God's plan from the very beginning. It's reframing our understanding of ourselves and the world and how God moves in history. Maybe this is a blessing that you don't believe about yourself either. Paul is, is speaking to us as well, that God has set affection for you before the creation of the world, that you are part of the eternal purposes of God and not just one of us, not just a single one of us, not just this church, but all of us. And you, specifically you. God has destined for you to be God's adopted child. And simply, that is simply the truth out of God's good pleasure and grace. You know, I think that someone who, who struggled with this a little bit is Fred Rogers. Within Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, he had a bunch of different you know, puppets that would talk and would speak to children. There's a fantasy land that exists there, and one of them was uh, a tiger named Daniel. Daniel uh, was the one who represented who Fred really was. Daniel was Fred's voice, the voice that he could be earnest with, the voice that he could be truthful and vulnerable with without actually having to say it himself. And so there's an episode where Daniel the tiger speaks uh, to his, uh, his friend, uh, Lady Aberlin, about mistakes. And Daniel wonders if he's a mistake. He sings a song. He says, sometimes I wonder if I'm a mistake. I'm not like anyone else I know. And when I'm asleep or even awake, sometimes I get to thinking that I'm just a fake. And Lady Aberlin, in, in trying to encourage him and respond to him, looks right at him and says, I think you are just fine as you are. I really must tell you, I do like the person that you are becoming. When you are sleeping, when you are waking, you are my friend. It's really true. I like you. And they begin to sing a duet together. And this is the part that's really beautiful about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, right? Like typically when these sorts of things happen, they resolve instantly, right? Okay, well, Daniel Tiger has heard that from his friend that he's loved and accepted, and so you expect Daniel Tiger to respond, okay, no, I get it now. I'm loved and accept accepted, except that's not what happens. The duet that they begin to sing together, Daniel Tiger continues to push toward that place 
of, of being lost, of, of feeling depressed, of feeling like he doesn't have a place in the world, that he is a mistake. And his friend continues to sing along with him to remind him that he is loved, that he is needed, and that he is wanted. His worries and doubts still ring loud and clear, demonstrating for, for children in the audience, right, that these things don't get resolved quickly. These feelings don't go away just from a reminder from a friend. They take a long time for us to heal and for us to understand and believe that we are loved. I think that's really how the first hearers of this letter from the Ephesians responded to God's love and grace. It happens to us as well. In the back of our mind, the, play, the tape plays over and over again. The record keeps going around. This cannot possibly be about me. God couldn't possibly love me as much as God loves others. I've messed up too many times. I've, I'll never be good enough. I'm the second choice. But I guess it's better than nothing. We hear because this is how like, psychologically we respond to some of these things. We hear rejection and failure and shame and pain and guilt and guilt. We keep on keep trying to push to go above and beyond to tell us that God lavishes grace upon us. And, God's, and Paul's message about what God is doing is bigger than just us. God has a plan for the fullness of time that all things in heaven and earth will be gathered up in Christ. Nothing and no one will be lost. There's no lost cause or a place without hope in God's creation. There are no nor heights nor depths that God's love cannot reach. And I think that Paul begins his letter here because if we truly believe this, if we take this in internally, it has the power to change everything for us. Who would you be if you believed with every fiber of your being that God is delighted in you? Not in what you produce, not in what you do, not in what your job is, but in who you are. How would you read the news if you believe that God has a plan for all of this, a plan for the good, that Christ is gathering up all things in him? How would it change how you live your life, how you vote, how you look at your neighbor, how you interact with people out in the world? How would you treat the family that moves into your neighborhood? With lives covered in and defined by grace, we set our hope on Christ that we might live for the praise of his glory. Because the world is so desperately in need of people who know that they are loved. And we can't give something that we don't possess. We can't tell people that God loves you and not believe it for ourselves. And when we know that we are loved and our ability, our ability to love others is magnified, the world needs people who know that God has chosen them, not above and instead of others, but as recipients of a gift from a giver whose supply knows no limits. Today, we celebrate the lives of the saints because the saints are those who've gone before us to understand the true value of this inheritance that we have received. Our inheritance is our redemption that's passed down to us through the lives of the saints, people who have come into our midst to remind us of God's great and enduring love for us. Because this Christian faith is carried out into the world by people by people who know the value of God's love for us. And how we understand that relationship to God is how we communicate, is how we live this life of faith. That's why well, how we live and what we say matters. What we believe about ourselves and what we believe about God matters to this world. And Paul praises the church in Ephesus for their commitment to uplifting and supporting the saints in their vital ministry. But he also acknowledges that there is so much more for us to understand about God. We keep going deeper. We keep seeking after that love that God has for us. We keep pouring over the grace that God gives to us. And we find the depths of what it is to be blessed that even in the difficulties and the tragedies of life, even in those hard moments, even in those moments where we are memorializing saints and we are mourning over the loss of loved ones, God is present before us and reminding us that God loves us. And when we live into our God-given vocation as a community of blessing, our neighborhoods and our lives are touched by heaven. 
we begin to see the kingdom of God take root among us and we see the, this world and the lives of the people in it transformed. We exist, the church exists to be a blessing unto others. And when we believe we are loved and we're, we are able to see others as equally loved, and that can be a challenge. That is a blessing and it is a challenge. It's the same love that, of God that comforts the afflicted, afflicts the comforted. That magnificent truth that God loves you also means that God loves those who you hate or who you don't understand or you don't get along with so well. And when Christ gathers all things up in him, that will include those who have been wronged, hurt, and betrayed by you, and by me. To truly believe that God is so in love with you, with your neighbor, and with your enemy will change the world. So when Daniel Tiger's song ends, and his friend looks him in the eye and says, you are the tiger I love most in the whole entire universe. Finally, Daniel responds and says, thank you, I love you too. We continue to learn from the saints from the ways in which they are vulnerable, from the ways in which they speak and act and love and give of themselves. People of God, you are, are so loved by the God who has adopted you. May you go out and live. Led by the example and urging of the saints who've gone before you, believing that you are God's dearly beloved. And turn back in praise to the God who loves you. Let us sing the songs of the people of God and give thanks for all God's gifts. Amen. We give thanks for the grace that God has given to us. And one of the places where that grace is real and manifest and tangible, touchable in our lives is at the communion table. Here on this table is bread and juice and those, these little cups that we have, these single serving cups. It's a small meal, but it is the grace of God that is broken and poured out for us. At this table, all people are welcome. So no matter how, how young you are or how old you are, you are welcome at this table. No matter your understanding of who God is and your place in the world, whether or not you believe that you are loved by God, chosen by God, adopted into God's family, this meal is for you whether this is your first time receiving communion or you've received it so many times you can't even remember your first time, this is for you. And today is special because we share in this table with the light of the saints that surround us, remembering that this is a meal that connects us through time and place to all of God's people all over the world in every age. This is a reminder of how big God's grace and love are. So friends, as we prepare to share in this meal, accept the gift. Taste and see that God is good and be blessed this day. If you are in need of a gluten-free option that is available to you, just let our servers know and they'll be sure to get that to you. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. In a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through our prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and now join in their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim the release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick. He fed the hungry and he ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he sat at a table with his disciples. And at that table, he took bread. And he gave thanks to you, O God, and he broke that bread, gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was finished, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, O God, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, and the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink of it, remember me. And so it's in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, saying, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. O God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and these cups of juice. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I invite our communion servers to come forward to assist us. Let us pray. Over 
gracious and giving God. We thank you. We thank you for this gift that you've given to us, this simple meal, this holy mystery. We ask, Lord, that you would allow this bread and this cup to fill us and sustain us until we are able to gather around your table once again. We thank you for the saints. We pray blessings upon all those who love you and follow in Jesus' footsteps. Help us to be Help us to believe that we are loved and to live by example. We give thanks to you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join in our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. We're singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. Friends, you are beloved. You have been named and claimed by God, adopted into a family that extends throughout the fullness of time. Believe that. Live your life in such a way that every person that you meet can see the love of God radiate from you. And may the light of the saints that have gone before lead you home in the grace of God. Let us share in our benediction together as we say, Go in peace. Love God and serve others. Amen. Amen.